My name is Wesley Johnston, and this is the story of my three related family thickets projects. Many St. Blasey families made the voyage from Cornwall to Canada and settled near English Corners. And there were many interconnections of those families on both sides of the pond. The chart on this slide illustrates one example of such multiple interconnections. Those interconnections were just as much a reality to those people as was the terrain where they lived. As they walked the lanes and passed Mary and George, they knew just how Mary and George were family. While we now look at family connections as somewhat of an abstraction, it was part and parcel of daily life for the people in those places. I chose the term family thickets for these collections of families because terms like orchard or forest fail to reflect those interconnections. A thicket is much more accurate as an image of just how these families related to each other. I'll start where it all began for me. In 1954, my father died and I inherited the Johnston family Bible. It began in Canada in 1861 and came all the way down to my brother and me. Fortunately, my great grandfather, George Henry Johnston, the one on the right, was glad to tell me what he knew. Great grandpa knew his father, John Johnston's ancestors were Scots-Irish, but he did not know much about his mother's ancestry. Butson was clearly an uncommon surname, but where did it come from? I began researching Canadian records. I learned that Emma's parents were Henry and Sarah Butson, and Henry had been an immigrant with his parents Solomon and Jane Keem Butson. Ultimately, in the pre-internet era, I knew that I had to make a research trip to Canada. So in 1977, I headed for Ontario. By 1977, I had done enough research to know that the Butson family were early settlers in Whitby Township, east of, of Toronto. In fact, Henry Butson's sister married in 1841 at what is now St. James Cathedral in Toronto. At the Ontario archives, I found the microfilm of the Pedlar papers. In the early 1900s, Samuel Pedlar interviewed many of the original settlers of the area near Oshawa and English Corners, north of Oshawa. And it turned out that many of them had come from Cornwall, and specifically the areas of St. Blasey, St. Austell, and Luxillian. At Oshawa, I visited the Oshawa Pioneer Memorial Garden, the former Methodist Cemetery, where all the stones are now in a central cairn. And there was Thomas Butson, the oldest son of Solomon Butson and Jane Keem. In the churchyard of St. Paul's Anglican Church, just west of Columbus, I found the gravestone of Solomon and Jane, my fourth great grandparents, who had brought their family of many children from Cornwall to Canada. So let's put this on the map. Columbus is due north of Oshawa, where I had found Thomas's Thomas Butson's stone in the Oshawa Memorial, Pioneer Memorial Garden. While I was in Ontario, I visited many relatives who I had located. Each had some unique piece of the jigsaw puzzle. Several, I learned, had transcribed copies of the text from a family Bible. No one knew who had the original, and I still don't know. The Family Bible gave the dates for the entire immigrant generation and revealed that they had all come from a place in Cornwall called St. Blasey. For the first time, I knew where their travels had begun. 
Discovering in 1977 that I had ancestry from Cornwall was perfect timing. The BBC Poldark series had begun on PBS Masterpiece Theater. Suddenly it was no longer just another period drama, but an insight into the life of my own ancestors. And so I knew I had to go to Cornwall, not just to do research, but just to be there and know what it feels like to be there. Of course, I now know that everything in Cornwall was always uphill. My most vivid memory of what that trip in 1981 came from the St. Blasey churchyard, which was then overgrown. My efforts to move the weeds to try to find family gravestones found no family gravestones, but it did leave me with both hands mightily swollen from the stings of the nettles. Up the road at Luxillian, I was rewarded at the churchyard as keen gravestones were easily visible from the road. Connections to the family of my fourth great grandmother, Jane Keem. And then when I went to the Royal Cornwall Museum Library to search for Butsons and Keems, the museum curator, Mr. H.L. Douch, told me to be sure to go to the main exhibit hall of the museum, as they then had an extensive display of Navajo items in Cornwall from the collection of Thomas Varker Keem, Indian trader. That's another story, a very interesting one, but not for today. So let's again put this on the map. This is the south coast of central Cornwall, where St. Austell and Foy are the main towns. The route on the map connects Jane Keem's birthplace at Luxillian with St. Blasey on the south. They did not live in St. Blasey Churchtown. They lived elsewhere in the parish at Biscovay and then at Bodelva. In fact, their Bodelva cottage is still there, just up the road from the clay mine where Solomon Butson worked. What is now an enormous pit, which he helped to make, that is now filled with the Eden Project, one of the most popular tourist destinations in Britain. We're still on my journey to my family's first family thickets project. We're almost there now. I learned that many of the St. Blasey families were the same families whose gravestones were there in the St. Paul Anglican Church Cemetery in Ontario. Not only that, but these families connected to each other in multiple marriages on both sides of the pond. This was my first recognition of what I later came to call family thickets. At the time, the best way I found to express it was to make a tweak to an old familiar saying. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to conceive. Faced with the massive amount of information I had gathered in Cornwall and Canada, I sought some way to organize it and present it. And so I began my first family thickets project, the English Corners Project. This is a chart of families from Reach and Whitby East Townships of Ontario County, families in the English Corners Project. Start with any person and follow the links and you will see that almost everyone is related to almost everyone else, not just in one way, but in multiple ways. This is a family thicket, not just a forest of separate trees. The green lines indicate other connections, a land transaction, a witness at the marriages of her two cousins. There are all sorts of connections. This slide is exciting to see everything so nicely laid out but the next several slides will be boring in comparison since they focus on the hard work that makes it possible to have a nice slide like this one. But how to begin? How did I figure out what to do? Napoleon Bonaparte had a famous tactic for combat. Engage, then see. Just do something, create something, then see how that works and decide the next step from there, from there. And so I began. I started by simply including everyone in a lineage-linked genealogy database. 
I'm going to jump way ahead now and look back at what it was that I came to see by doing these and other family thicket projects. On this one slide is all the wisdom that I learned from doing multiple family thicket projects. After doing so many of them, this is the methodology that I developed that works best for me. The first step is to have some form of big picture vision of what it is that I want to do in that project. To wrestle all that I have into some manageable and presentable form. This big picture vision does not have to be detailed. It, it is the high level view of a vision of what I would like to be able to do once I have all these things properly managed. What questions do I really want to answer? For example, this determines the scope, which is the next step. What is part of your project and even more importantly, what is not part of your project? For example, the scope of my St. Blasey's project includes families when they lived in St. Blasey and one or maybe two generations before or after they lived in St. Blasey. It does not include every family's entire lineage in every place they lived. The next two steps, gathering and organizing, are the real work. Uh, and work is the right word. This is not easy. Uh, as the charts on the right show, the complexity grows far faster than the number of people. Two people connect in one way. Five people connect in ten ways. But twelve people, six times as many as there are in the two people, connect in 66 ways, which is 66 times as many ways as two people connect. So complexity grows faster, far faster than the number of people. Once everything is organized, you go on to the next step. You analyze it. You look and find and reveal information and knowledge buried in the mass of individual records. And then you can present that information and knowledge and insight in many creative ways, the final step. So this is the methodology that I've learned to do family thickets projects. Make no mistake about it, a family thicket project takes a lot of work in the gathering and organizing, and really it never stops. As you'll see, you have to somehow just say, all right, I've got enough now that I can start doing some analysis, but you keep gathering and you keep organizing, and then you do more analysis later. But once you have done all this laborious, tedious work, then you see that the analysis is made possible by all that work, and it reveals a great many insights. We will look first at the tedious work of gathering and organizing. Then I will show some of the results of the analysis. This. From here on, I will show how I manage these steps for each of the three projects, starting with the gathering phase. I began with the English Corners project, but then when I saw the St. Blasey Parish registers, and on almost every image saw a name that I knew somehow was a relative, I realized that I needed a St. Blasey family project as well. And as I worked on the two and learned of the voyages from Padstow to Canada, I realized that these same families merited yet a third project of their voyages and the ships that brought them. 
This slide shows some of the resources that I used for the St. Blasey Families Project. Based in Cornwall, it is also clearly based in Cornish records. The parish register images were the primary driver of my progress. Simply working through them, page after page, reconstructed families. I started with the 1813 entries and worked forward in time. As needed, I relied on the Cornwall Family History Society's online research database and the Cornwall Online Parish Clerks databases. Sometimes I jumped ahead to the censuses using Ancestry. Some of the families came from Devon or moved to Devon. They followed wherever the work was. So Find My Past's West Devon records were helpful. Cornish wills are not easily find, found. Some of the online parish clerk pages do have wills. I have done an exhaustive search for 1601 to 1857 Keem wills in Cornwall. In that period of 256 years, I found only 19 wills. So these are not numerous, but wills are a great source for family relationships. Multiple health problems over the years have pulled the rug out from under everything else in my life, including working on my family thickets projects. So my progress on them is irregular, coming in a few weeks of intense effort between many months of minimal effort or no effort at all. This is frustrating. With the St. Blasey Families Project, I have completed the first volumes of baptisms and marriages and made significant progress on the first volume of burials, which is a really difficult volume because it does not give any family relationships. The rest of the parish registers, the censuses, and everything else still awaits. Gathering information for my English Corners project focused on the primary driver, the gravestones in the St. Paul's Anglican Churchyard. Local historian Christine Ferguson volunteered to photograph every stone in the cemetery for me. It is an active cemetery. The oldest, cemetery, the oldest stones are gathered in a central cairn. So the caretaker has to figure out where to safely dig for new burials since there is no record of the locations of all of the old burials. When I visited him in 1977, he taught me how to do dousing, which is his tried and true method for finding safe new burial spots. Of course, the Canadian censuses and what birth, marriage, and death records are online help solidify the information and connect the families. A transcribed version of the Pedlar papers is now online at the URL on the slide. And Ancestry now includes the Ontario marriages for all counties back to 1858. Gathering information from my Cornwall to Canada Voyages project began with the personal accounts in the Pedlar papers. Once I had posted the website, people whose ancestors were on those voyages contacted me and provided more information, sometimes much more. Another important source, which I also used for the St. Blasey Families Project, was the wonderful website for the West Britain and Cornwall Advertiser newspaper. This was begun by Julia Mossman and Rita Bone Cop, and has since been aided by more transcribers. If you are doing any research in Canada, in Cornwall, you should use this site for the newspaper. Not only did the newspaper record ships, but vital events, often including vital events of people no longer living in Cornwall. After the gathering step, I had to figure out how to organize this mass of information that exists in multiple formats and levels of completeness and confidence. For the English Corners and St. Blasey Families projects, I chose to use lineage link databases with Ancestry's online trees as the master copies, the master copy. <clears throat> Thus, my task was to fit every person on every record of every type 
into their proper place in the database, connected to their proper relatives. No small feat. For the, Corn for the Cornwall to Canada Voyages project, I chose to post the information in an organized form on a website with one section for ship and voyage information and another section for information on the families. Working on the English Corners project, I quickly realized I had some information such as images and maps that simply did not fit into a database. So I also created a web pit site for the English Corners project and ultimately I did the same for St. Blasey. Multiple issues require ongoing attention. Having separate databases for each project means that the same person can be in more than one database. It also means that a person in one database may connect to a person in the other database. So that I have to check for this possibility when it seems likely. I could have merged the databases into one database. That would have eliminated the redundancy and the issue of people connecting across databases but it would also introduce problems that led me to conclude it would do more harm than good. So I keep the databases separate for each project. Merging them into a single database would combine the names into a single massive list so that the names unique to one project would be intermixed to the names of the other project. That's fine for people who belong in both projects, but it makes it harder to find the right one when two people of the same name are unique to different projects. A Scots Canadian who married a Cornish Canadian in the English Corners project would have no real place in the St. Blasey database. The opposite is true of a St. Blasey family that moved to Lancashire and married a local who never went to Canada. The different levels of confidence in the accuracy of the sources for the different places provides further reason for keeping them separate. There is no one best way to do it. You might choose to combine your project databases, but I have chosen to keep them separate. Organizing the many pieces of information runs into other problems. Some conclusions are solidly and easily documented, while others require extensive documentation and still result in uncertain conclusions. I write research notes in such situations. Initial organization goes fairly quickly as you deal with few people and sources. But as more people and sources join the mix, complexity, as I noted in the diagram earlier, grows much more rapidly than a number of people. People often ask, how can I help? I really do not know a good answer to that. I want to be the one who makes all the additions to the database so that, I can, so that I can assure consistency, the same level of care, and the same method applied to every entry in the database. It's not just the sources and people that increase. Posting the website on the internet brings emails with new information, sometimes quite substantial. These usually require a focus on a specific family, thus taking away from the systematic entry from the main sources. I am also glad to answer the occasional inquiry from a St. Blasey homeowner wanting to know the history of those who lived in the house before them. Now we have gathered a lot of information and put in a significant effort to organize it. So what do we do? There will, be never, there will never be an end to gathering and organizing. So we have to do our analysis with what we have so far. The results of the analysis are most beneficial when they are presented so that the knowledge they divulge is visible. But again, we have the question of what to do. How do, I do how do I best do analysis and present it? And once again, the answer is just do some analysis and presentation, and you will learn from that what works and what does not so that you can improve a bit in your next effort. 
And the slide shows some of the ways that I have done this. I've created websites for the projects, made PDFs of the results of analytical reports and posted them to the website, written articles for journals to present what I had found. And the St. Blasey database led me to create my first TNG website. TNG is the next generation of genealogy software. The learning curve was steep, but I now have 23 TNG websites for my various projects. Now we're going to see the exciting stuff. I have used a variety of forms to present the information that I had gathered and organized, providing the list of surnames of all people in the database to the Wordle software and adjusting the formatting controls. You can nicely show which are the most numerous names in your database. I mentioned that I write research notes in situations of uncertainty. This comes up most often when I need to disambiguate the people of the same name at the same time in the same place. This slide shows just a small number of the titles of the many research notes that I have written. They are usually extensive since they require gathering all the conflicting source information into the research note and then reaching a working conclusion about how, how I will represent the people in my database. These conclusions remain uncertain in many cases so that I make it clear that solid new evidence can result in a completely different conclusion. I convert some of these research notes into journal articles. It was years ago during a break in the annual gathering of the California Cornish Cousins that I went to my room at the Paso Robles Inn and I first tried to visually represent the complicated interconnections I had found of the families in the main English Corners database. I was able to fit these 18 surnames into the diagram before the limits of two dimensions stopped what I could do without overlapping any of the lines. Simple as the diagram is, it clearly reveals the interconnections with double lines representing multiple connections between families. I tried using an Excel spreadsheet to represent interconnections of some of the surnames in the St. Blasey Families Project. It was not as visually pleasing, but it did provide a way in which I could easily modify the diagram if I wanted to include another surname. Ultimately, I decided to see what a robust graphing tool could do with all of the connections between families in the St. Blasey Families database. At the time, I had 659 couples. So what would the diagram look like if I threw everything at the software? This slide shows the view from about 35,000 feet. Different clusters clearly exist, and this merits further examination an insight into the mass of individual records that no other analysis is, has presented. So the analysis leads to knowledge and insight, which leads to further analysis. The YED graphing software, which is free, comes with the ability to zoom in on any part of the complex diagram. Here you can see that a keem married a keem, creating the circular arrow from the keem node back to itself. You can also see which of the surnames connected most with the others. The Stevens node has many arrows going in and out. So the same sort of clustering that existed at the 35,000 foot level exists as you zoom in. 
I used various ways of presenting frequency charts. This is a simple one that I created in Excel using just the cells and not Excel's graphing tool. You can clearly see that there was quite a boom in births in the 1820s, a real jump from the previous decade. It turns out that this coincided with a boom in the number of families moving to St. Blasey in that decade. This slide shows one of the reports I saved as a PDF file. It is one of the reports in legacy family tree software. It shows Ann Jennings and how she connects to everyone in the database with whom she has any kind of relationship. As I said, the connections of families that lived in the same place for generations were just as real to them as the terrain where they lived. And this report really shows how true that was. A ninth cousin and I collaborated on a family thickets project for Probstock in Germany. Once I had it all in the database after years of work, I discovered that 60% of the people who lived there from about 1600 to 1850, a period of 250 years, about 60% of them were related to my ancestor, either by blood or by a single marriage. That one revelation made all the years of work to reach that point worth the effort. Of course, I also used Excel's charting tools, which are really good tools. This one shows how many people in the database each of the people on the left relates to. For example, Elizabeth Button, the second one from the top, is connected to only 10 other people in the database. But Jane Pascoe at the bottom connects to 370 other people in the database. Another legacy family tree report that I captured as a PDF listed every location in the database and the people who had any life event at that location. A more difficult challenge was to find the earliest emigrant from St. Blasey to a specific country. For the people I had in the database, I was able to identify the first to come to the US and the first to come to Canada. I was pleasantly surprised that I was even able to identify the ships on which they sailed. As I said, the Cornwall to Canada voyages went directly into a web page and I have no database. The web page has a section for each ship and a section for each family. This is the section for the ship Dewdrop with information on two of its voyages. And this is the section for the Henwood and Lovering families. For the English Corners project, I sought some way to show everyone in the cemetery and how they related to everyone else. So I created a web page of family information blocks. This one is for the stone for the infant Margaret Ellen Harper. The top shows her name and dates and where she lived. It also shows the surnames of the families to which her family connected. The left side shows her gravestone and photos of her parents. The thin blue section has the transcription of her gravestone. The pink section has the chronology of all the records I have found related to her family members. The bottom green section gives specifics of how she related to the different families listed in the top section. Clearly, creating just one of these family information blocks could require a great deal of work, but it gives a nice visual presentation that pulls together everything about that family, all tied to a specific gravestone. I made a major effort to create an Excel, an Excel spreadsheet 
that was a rough map of the east half of Whitby Township in the 1851-2 agricultural census. The earliest maps showing who was on each lot are those of the 1870s county atlases, but the agricultural schedules of the 1851 and 1861 censuses gave the concession and lot of every landowner. So I was able to create my own rough map of the landowners a quarter century before the county atlases. I think it would be a marvelous project if some university or some group of universities would do the same for every township in Ontario. But instead of putting the names into an Excel spreadsheet, they would place them into the lots on a map of the township. Here is a zoom on concessions eight and nine and lots six, seven, eight, and nine. You can clearly see Butson's on different lots showing how the sons spread out from the father, Solomon, as they married and set up their own households and farms. This is the same Solomon Butson who helped dig that pit that is now the home of the Eden Project. He gave up clay mining in St. Blasey to became, become a landowner and farmer in Whitby Township. My first webpage for the St. Blasey Family Project was before I made the effort to, put, to post the database as a TNG website. I reported, I exported the database to a GEDCOM file, which I allowed to be downloaded. And I posted the results of the analyses I had done. This website remains online, updated from time to time. But instead of the GEDCOM download, I now have a link to the TNG website to provide a much more robust presentation of the database. TNG, as I said before, stands for the Next Generation of Genealogy Software. It now comes with about 20 templates from which you can choose one for the site. Some TNG users have their primary databases on the website. I keep my primary database on Ancestry and roll out a frozen snapshot from time to time with living people privatized. This is the home page. Each person has their own page and there are many statistical facts as a standard part of TNG. The longest lived person, total unique surnames, earliest birth, a pie chart showing proportions of males and females. You need to have space on a server for this, but TNG's creator, Darren Lithgow, has great videos for how to do basic installations so that he makes it fairly easy for anyone to set up a TNG website. And that is my presentation. I have many books available on Amazon. These three are the ones most relevant to family historians. My Family Thickets book goes into much more detail about Family Thicket projects than I have been able to share here. My Researcher's Guide to the Pre-Fire -pre Records of Chicago and Cook County took me several years to glean from the Illinois State Archives voluminous files from the 1930s Historical Record Survey, an exhaustive inventory that was never published because the work stopped when World War II began. In the 1990s, I conducted all-day workshops on Dad's War, finding and telling your father's World War II story. Major health problems forced me to abandon the workshops, but I was finally able to publish the extensive workshop booklet that I had prepared and gave to each workshop participant. I hope my presentation has inspired you to think about a family thicket project that you might do. If you do start a project, be sure to register it with the Society for One Name One Place Studies. So now it is time for your questions. <laughs>